So first of all, let me do the obligatory conflict of interest disclosures. Uh, for this talk specifically, the ones you should pay most attention to are Covidian. Um, they have a device that you already heard about for the treatment of DVT. The Ecos Corporation, I'm a member of the Data Safety and Monitoring Board. And uh, I have a uh, an investment interest in this small little company called Embolitech. But aside from that, shouldn't be anything else. If you have any questions about my conflicts now or afterwards, don't hesitate to stop me. So as Greg mentioned, I was truly privileged to uh, be one of the people working closely on the American Heart Association guidelines. You've already heard about these. Uh, what's really interesting about this is the groups that participated in this guidelines document reflects how the management of deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolism is uh, provided around the world. All sorts of different practitioners involved in the treatment of venous thromboemboli. So you can see here cardiopulmonary critical care, perioperative and resuscitation, the peripheral vascular disease council, and the arteriosclerosis thrombosis and vascular biology group. And the specialties that were represented, again, show you the broad level of interest and expertise that exists around this field. Now, why did the American Heart Association pursue guidelines on the management of venous thromboemboli? Well, it was believed that the previous CHEST guidelines, the eighth guidelines that you've already heard a lot about, had been published in 2008. Several years had gone by. They didn't really highlight detailed recommendations about the most severe manifestations of VTE. So this one, the American Heart Association guidelines, looked at the really big proximal iliofemoral DVT, like the case you just saw, uh, big pulmonary emboli, and then chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. And we felt it was important to update the peer-reviewed literature. Now, since the AHA guidelines uh, were published, the group that, that I worked on with Sam and several others, the ninth chest consensus guide, guidelines have been published. You've heard about these already, but these are the most modern guidelines that are out there now. And what did we learn in the ninth chest guidelines? Well, we heard some information about who should receive thrombolytic therapy for acute PE? You already heard a lot about this, so I won't uh, belabor this, other than the fact that you cannot underscore the importance of how the patient looks. That's kind of the art of medicine, the judgment. Does the patient look sick? Oftentimes, that in and of itself is a very important discriminator between medical therapy and lytic therapy. And then, of course, they talked about how to deliver thrombolysis through a peripheral intravenous catheter. But frankly, there were no formal recommendations about the types of procedures that Piot just talked to you about. We wonder about the risk of deterioration during pulmonary embolism, and so the pulmonary embolism severity index has been uh, recommended as one way of putting some science behind how sick the patient looks. And you can see here, what are the components that make up this risk calculator? And by the way, you can do this on the web for free. You can kind of plug it in and hope that you don't get a bad score while you're sitting watching the ball game or something. But, but you can see here age, whether the patient's a man or a woman, whether there's a history of all sorts of comorbidities. And then here's that part that I told you about, about the gestalt, about how sick they look. H rapid heart rate, rapid breathing, low blood pressure. Those are all kind of bad things. And then uh, a low temperature, low body temperature, meaning that the patient's body system starting to collapse altered mental status because they're not getting enough blood and oxygen to the brain, and then an objective measurement of low oxygen saturation. So let's just play around with this. You take a 66-year-old person who happens to be a man, has a heart rate over 110, breathing pretty rapidly, and an O2 saturation of uh, less than 90%. Their pulmonary embolism severity index score is 136, considered very high risk, with a 30-day mortality rate of anywhere between 10 and 25 percent. Now, you'll notice here, the objective criteria here really do lend itself to how sick does the patient look. Now, the AHA guidelines, the ones that I worked on that were before those ninth guidelines, actually looked at the most severe manifestations of PE. You already saw some examples of this. And, you know, we make a real concern about hemodynamics. And the reason we worry about low blood pressure kind of as a marker is what we know from data about what happens to people with pulmonary embolus who have low blood pressure. They have a 90-day mortality rate of 
you can see why we feel pretty comfortable saying we better call out the cavalry when we see somebody with an acute pulmonary embolus and low blood pressure. We also know that the in-hospital death rate for pulmonary embolus in those who are in shock is 25%. In hospital, one in four patients will die. And if they need CPR for this pulmonary embolus, over two-thirds of these patients die in the hospital. So this is really tough. But again, there's this big group, the group that really make me nervous. In fact, they're the ones where I say, call Dr. Goldhaber. He knows what to do. <laughs> this is the submassive pulmonary embolism group, the group right in the middle. They have a big blood clot, but their blood pressure is not too low. They do have evidence on an echo of not great squeezing of the right ventricle, as you saw before, or they have evidence, as you also saw from Dr. Piazza, of elevated troponin levels. These are markers that these are patients that could go south literally at any time. But we really don't know if going after these patients right away is going to make them get over this faster and live longer, or can we just ride them out for a few days in the hospital on heparin? We don't know. So everybody gets anticoagulation right away. That's most important. Why? Not because we think it's going to necessarily dissolve the blood clot, but it's going to give it less likely of a chance to have another blood clot happen while you're trying to figure out what to do. That takes a bad situation and makes it suddenly really bad. And then you can go through these algorithms. I love these things. So can you imagine, you know, you're standing there, the patient's really feeling sick and go, wait a minute, I got to pull out my iPhone and go walk down and you got to go this way. So the bottom line is this is all, a lot of this is really gestalt. And the truth is, if the blood pressure is low, do something. If the blood pressure is not low and you have time to think about this, either ask somebody else who's got a lot more experience about how to manage this, pull your team together and develop a plan to follow the patient over time and make a decision about further treatment. Now, what about catheter-based treatments? We already heard a lot about this, but one thing I will say, and Piotr is a modest guy, so he wouldn't tell you this, but you don't want someone like me doing a pulmonary catheter procedure on you. Trust me, you don't want me to do that. So the expertise of the person who's there at the bedside is a critical decision maker as to whether a catheter should be placed in your pulmonary artery or not. If they're really experienced and really good at this, and they say, you know what, I think you're going to need this because things aren't going well, I'd let them do it. But if I come and say, hey, you know what, I've always wanted to try this, <laughs> eh, I'd, I'd think about going someplace else. Um, and certainly in patients who have big pulmonary emboli where you can't give a lytic agent because they have obvious evidence of bleeding, like, you know, two weeks ago they vomited up bright red blood and had a stomach ulcer. That's not somebody you'd want to give doses of a lytic agent through an IV and see what happens. It's also really not recommended in people who really are not sick looking and whose echoes don't look so bad and whose blood tests are normal. Those are people that you can kind of watch and take care of and see how they do. Now, what about IVC filters? Well, we really didn't talk about this, and I can't go into detail, but I love talking about IVC filters. You know what these are? These are the baskets that are placed very simply under local anesthesia in the big vein in the belly so that if a blood clot breaks off from your leg and heads up north, it gets caught before it can do any damage. And now the IVC filters that we asked Piotr and his colleagues to put in can be retrieved. So let's say you... Uh, uh, I don't know, you're riding your motorcycle and your mom told you never to ride a motorcycle and you get in an accident and, you know, you're paralyzed or, God forbid, you break a bone and you have to lay in bed for a while with a cast and you can't be put on blood thinners because you just had big trauma. You put this filter in, you wait until the risk of bleeding with blood thinners goes away, you start on blood thinners and you pull out the filter. It's actually pretty cool. The problem is it's so easy to do and so easy to remove that a lot of these filters are going in for somewhat questionable reasons. And so I would tell you that you ought to be pretty strict about putting these things in. Because even though I made it sound like gravy, bad things can happen from these filters. So I would tell you that you put a filter in in someone who has a new big blood clot, either in the leg or the lung, and absolutely cannot get a blood thinner. Active bleeding, recent big surgery, things like that. Someone who has had a blood clot to the lung, you start them on blood thinners, you have them fully thinned. 
Everything's perfect. The INR on warfarin's 2.5 or they're on rivaroxaban for a month and things are going well and they have another new blood clot. That's a bad sign. They probably need a filter. And then someone who's had a massive pulmonary embolus who can ill afford another one while you're just trying to get out of trouble. Those are people who probably warrant a filter. Now, I would tell you that when you do have the filter in, as soon as you have the chance to go on blood thinners, you ought to be started on them. And again, one of the reasons for that, I know it sounds crazy, is these filters can clot. So if a clot breaks off and goes to the filter and clogs up the filter, that whole big vein below it can clot. And then the clot can creep above the filter and cause another blood clot to the lung. So when you can, if you can, put somebody on blood thinners, you probably ought to, and then you ought to constantly reevaluate the patient to see if that filter can be removed. And if it can, get it out. They're designed to come out. It's better if they're out, unless your risk of continued clotting is so high that you got to leave it in. Trust me when I tell you, only a third of these temporary filters that are put in with the intention of coming out ever actually come out. So it's really worth asking about. And I, I just don't think they should be routinely done. I think you should just think about them. So in the guidelines document we did, we already talked about this. I'm not going to go over this in great detail. You heard a lot about this already, including how long to keep somebody on blood thinners, whether you should wear compression stockings or not. Um, and then, of course, the question about catheter versus surgical venous thrombectomy. Uh, clearly, the key answer here is that you do these procedures in a place that's got a lot of experience, like this place. Uh, those are really kind of key points. All right, now, again, I mentioned the toughest patient is this one, and this just was published in JAMA by our own Dr. Piazza this evening uh, in just a couple of weeks ago, and this is actually an algorithm that's pretty easy to follow. This is a good one, actually, to keep on your iPhone, and this one basically walks through the things you should think about in the toughest of patients. So the submassive PE, that group in between they're going to die if you don't do something, or gee, they look so good you can send them home on a pill. And you go through the checklist of which way to go. And if you break towards the yes, then you start considering the more aggressive therapy. I think it's a very thoughtful algorithm to use. Now, finally, how do these guidelines all compare? The AHA guidelines, the Ninth Chess cons Consensus Conference guidelines? Well, they compare to some degree. This is a worthwhile table to look at. The bottom line is that there are some subtle differences, and the differences are based on the fact that the literature is not that good. So it generally comes out to opinion, experience, professional time spent managing these very difficult patients. Now, one last thing. One thing we didn't talk too much about is what happens in someone who gets a big blood clot to the lung. They survive it, thank God. You have them on blood thinners, and things just don't go too well after that. They keep coming back saying, Doc, I just am still winded. I still can't walk like I could before. I just don't feel like my energy's back. You got to think about this thing called CTEF or chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. It's another one of those medical terms made to make you get intimidated, but it's actually pretty easy. Chronic means long standing, right? Thromboembolic means blood clot from one place to another, in this case, to the lungs. Pulmonary is the lungs and hypertension is high blood pressure. This is bad high blood pressure to have. This is not the same as when they put a cuff around the arm. This is high blood pressure in the lungs. And if this gets bad enough, the heart fails, and then you die. And it's a miserable, miserable disease. And so you want to think about this in patients who just don't recover well from a pulmonary embolus, despite all appropriate therapy. There are all sorts of types of uh, chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. And we always think about this in people with shortness of breath or exercise intolerance or evidence of right-sided failure with or without a history of pulmonary embolus. Remember that a lot of patients can have these small events and not know it or not go to the doctor and tell them, and then the next thing you know, they've had a bunch to the lungs and they're left with this. It's certainly reasonable to think about looking for this in many patients, certainly those who don't feel great six weeks after a pulmonary embolus. Now, what about treatment? So the first thing you do is think about definitive treatment because there really isn't great medical therapy for CTEF. And definitive treatment is removing the clots, the chronic clots, the obstruction from the lungs.
This is an operation that, again, requires a skilled surgeon who's done a lot of these. They stay on blood thinners forever, and medical therapy really is only considered for those who are not candidates to have the operation. They're too sick. It's gone on too long. There are some medical therapies we won't talk about too much. So again, I think the highlights of this you've already heard. The foods are cooking, so I'm going to just skip through these. And, and uh, trust me when I tell you that you got more information tonight in these couple hours than most physicians have in their career. I applaud NATF and thanks for your tolerance.